Hello there, I'm Eric Peckham, and this is the Monetizing Media Podcast. As with my Monetizing Media newsletter, my goal is to dissect business opportunities across the media, entertainment, and gaming sector. I'm joined by a leading entrepreneur, executive, or investor in each episode as we dig into a case study on their company, an investment thesis they have, or other tactical insights on business models, pricing, and creating loyal fans. Today, I'm excited to dive into a conversation with Mikhail Chell, the co-founder and CEO of Unsplash. In just a few short years, Unsplash has become one of the largest stock image libraries. Unlike Getty Images and Shutterstock, all photos on Unsplash are completely free to use with no restrictions on their use. Images from Unsplash's curated 2 million photo library now blanket the internet with 18 billion photo views in the last month and integrations in platforms like Medium and Squarespace. Of course, the obvious question here is, how do you make money by offering photos for free? Mikhail was kind enough to do a case study, talking through how Unsplash developed its current business model. Mikhail, excited to chat today. Yeah, same here, Eric. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm eager to dive into the process you've gone through over the last couple of years in particular in growing Unsplash and figuring out its business model. I think you saw this big opportunity, which was there's an enormous demand for photos on the internet for all sorts of different use cases, but all the stock photo sites really go against how most people want to use photos. Yeah. And so you have provided this massive, massive library of you know, free to use photos. You can use whatever uh, for whatever. Um, but obviously the, the question there is, well, how do you make money off of it? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I'm curious, I guess, to lay the context for us, walk me through the decision of in, especially as you raised money for Unsplash and kind of turned it from a project into a business, mm -hmm. the decision to really stick with photos being free and with no restrictions when no one else mm -hmm. was doing that in the industry. Yeah. Uh, it was challenging because there's a, there's a big amount of risk to it because it's, uh, you know, when we made that transition, we still didn't exactly know how best to monetize it. Uh, and part of it depended on how big we thought Unsplash could actually get. So we did start to see the usage numbers. Uh, they were more than like Shutterstock and more than Getty. And that was happening on a per month basis. And now it's more than Shutterstock, Getty and Adobe Stock combined. And so when we were able to sort of map that out and see the spread, we're like, okay, the market, you know, this is getting interesting where we could apply a, a whole new model because previously, See, like image use was more in the professional use case. And what happened over time is it really just spread to sort of everyone, right? But we were going, we were going to Google images. We we're going to these places to try to find images to use, but none of those places were made for image use. And when you have that change in the market, we thought we could change the business model. And so how long, especially after raising venture capital and kind of adding some of that extra pressure, how long did you feel Unsplash could go without a clear revenue model? Yeah. Um, At that fundraising moment, we did present this as our primary business model. Just mm -hmm. a lot of the levers that made it work weren't figured out yet. So yeah. by that time, we were already confident that this is this is going to be the, the model of the future. We're going to push on this, and this is going to be the focus. And then once we raised that funding, we wanted to raise enough where we could really figure out building the right version of this business. Is if someone is putting money into a company and thinking of it as a different future of a business, that can just totally change how you build something. Yeah. So all the investors that we were looking at were like, you need to be aligned with how we're thinking about this in the long term. This is going to be uh, an ad supported model because of how this creative industry has evolved. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's an interesting thing. You see these creative industries evolving at different paces and where photography is, it's in this pace, you know, it's been in the stock, it's been in the subscription and sort of there's, there's this new model that's sort of wanting to be created. Yeah. And, and to be clear for those listening, the model you guys have settled on is one where brands are paying you to put their own photos into kind of your database and have them featured. And the benefit is, you know, if, if they have a great photo that also has their product in it in some way, or kind of ties back to their brand then that could be used millions of times across the internet and be this kind of huge free advertising campaign. Is that that's a correct. good way to describe it? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, it, it's essentially a visual search engine where all the images can be used. When the brands post their visuals, those visuals can be used. And so, yes, you reach this big audience that's an Unsplash, but really it's about how you're spreading it around everywhere on the internet. So we think of Unsplash more as actually like a real estate company 
than just like this destination site. And all of the internet's real estate, if you think about it, is becoming much more visual. Yeah, it's an interesting comparison. Um, was it hard to get investors on board with this business model as being viable? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I think 5% was our you know investors who were like, yep, get it, I, I can see that let's build towards that um and even you know that was that took some convincing as well yeah can you walk me through the other um paths that you guys considered in in looking at the possible business models here which perhaps aren't mutually exclusive there are still things yeah. to layer on top yeah so we have an api you know, where we offer you know you can pipe unsplash images into your product and offer them directly in in a service like that we've got a thousand eight hundred of those integrations so there's ideas of like, oh, you could charge for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we thought about other things where if you wanted early access to images, you know, that you could potentially have like a premium offering for those sorts of things. Uh, and we, it was really a matter of prioritization for us. The thing that aligned the most with, I think, creating the most access and also aligning with our mission. So for us, it's we need to make images accessible to enable everybody to create. So if you start gating things, automatically you're not being as accessible as you could be. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep all that open and, and this model aligned the best with that. But those were some of the, the other ideas. Yeah. Do you see a, um, an untapped willingness by consumers or kind of amateur creators who love your product to spend money? Like is, is there kind of a big consumer surplus here that you guys aren't tapping but, but have gotten a lot of feedback that actually there's so many people who would be happy to pay in one way or another? Yes, I, I think there would be. Anecdotally, we've gotten this. We've gotten this through surveys as well. Uh, I think there's a big chunk of the community that would pay something for mm -hmm. Unsplash. I don't know how enduring that would be. You know, if we created enough value for that, um, what that does to, yeah, the alignment with the mission. So that sort of cloud around those questions, we didn't have that same cloud when we looked at this Unsplash for brands where you could r feature brands on tops of the searches. Yeah, gotcha. Um, going back to uh, a few of the potential business models you just mentioned, so like use of the API, right now that's all for free, right? It's not revenue yes. generating for yeah. you. What's been your consideration there of why, why it started free, why you're keeping it free right now? And is there something specific you're, you're still looking for or trying to evaluate in deciding whether or not that should change? Uh, two main things, it aligned with the mission. So it, it keeps the access open, put it right in the images. So if you're in Medium and writing a blog post, for example, uh, and you want to use that image for the blog post, you don't get hit with like paywalls and size, weird things, license conditions. Uh, we didn't want that experience. So that was first and foremost. Uh, and the second thing, it aligns with the, the business model of spreading the images. So ha having just a destination site, you know, Unsplash, now you're competing with Facebook, Google, driving everybody to this place, uh, whereas we can actually compete across 1,800 plus destinations. Uh, and that just changes the game because you've got, as a photographer, you're coming to post on Unsplash, you can have your image appear on this place, but you can have it appear everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of the unique license, really where I found we did the most innovation was on the license. We've changed the license to be an open license and that, that means that you can do these things with images for the first time. Is, is part of this about just the negotiating power between you and, and kind of platforms that use your API, where maybe in the early days, you know, it was to some extent more helpful for you to gain the extra distribution. Um, but in kind of now or in the future, maybe it's actually that, that people are eager to have unsplashed images and, and you have a bit more negotiating room to ask to be paid for that. Yeah, I, I think you know there would be a chunk of API partners who'd be willing and interested to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't necessarily still feel like the core of this doesn't align with the the mission, so we do want to keep it open. Um, but to say that that exists, that there's people who maybe want to pay, that there's more uh, power to pay or have that ability to have it happen because people see how good the integration does from an engagement perspective, uh, I think that is it, it is there. Uh, yeah. We've just really chosen to keep this aligned with the the mission and the current business model. Yeah, gotcha. Um, speaking of the current business model, can you give us a state of of where that stands right now? Kind of when you launched it, and then how many brands have gotten on board thus far? 
Yeah, 2019 was all of getting the first brands on, um, testing across the verticals. We wanted to make sure it actually worked, so we weren't selling like snake oil with this new ad product, and uh, we tested everything. So across all the major advertising verticals, travel, CPG, uh, we had big brands, small brands. We had like, people like Harley Davidson, Square, all the way to sort of a, if I said the name, you wouldn't know it, a Canadian like juice brand that nobody really knew because we wanted to test is it how much of a factor is it that you already know the brand, if it's a new brand, uh, kinds of visuals. And what we saw across the board was uh, Unsplash was statistically significant in terms of how it could impact brand lift. So this is measures all the way from brand awareness through perception down through purchase intent. Uh, whether you're a big brand, small brand, uh, whether the visual had the actual like branded product in it, and sometimes when it wasn't even there. So we mm -hmm. worked with like Maldives tourism. There's nothing in the actual image that says Maldives tourism. Um, and the reason that happens is when people would share these around, it would still say like image from Maldives tourism as the crediting. Yeah. So you have these interesting like mechanics that we saw during that, during those studies. And then our actual launch moment was December, 2019. And then, uh, so this is like our first full year sort of coming out with brands. Uh, we've seen the revenue, the revenue has grown about 5x once we did that launch. Uh, COVID hit, so we had some impact that happened there. Uh, we lost some deals, were paused, uh, but others actually continued through. And we weren't, we're still really early in um, getting some of the plans of some of the brands. So I think that still spoke to the effectiveness that a lot of the brands saw. They said, oh, th this is something unique. There's something that's potentially here that we could uh, still do and we see value in it and even if it's new and, and something that we haven't done before yeah trying this with brands across different industries and at different sizes have you found a sweet spot that you're focusing on as a result particularly cpg brands that are the biggest in the world or is there actually a big opportunity around smaller regional brands yeah right now the way the site uh really works the best in the targeting and everything it's uh global or North American focus type brands mm -hmm. uh, because we can, these images get used all over the place, right? So you might be reading an article and I might be reading an article and we see this image of Harley Davidson on it. Uh, it's helpful that we could go buy the actual Harley, you know, nearby yeah. versus the regional, uh, it doesn't quite yet have uh, that, that same like targeting capability. So where we're at in the product development and aligns the best with national brands, global brands, um, so this sort of lends itself to like the fortune 1000. Um, so we're really starting there. And then there's other brands who, you know, are coming up D to C brands. Um, uh, some of them are, are starting to move into those categories and just be really interesting and, and starting to try things. So some of them are included as well, Yeah. but it's still across the verticals. We've seen that a lot of, of different things across all these verticals, travel, CPG, consumer tech. Yeah. What, uh, pricing structure have you settled on in terms of our brands? paying per image are they paying on a performance-based model of how many times these images get used what what structure has been most effective uh so all the brands are paying on a cpm and what it is is you're you're essentially taking over x number of keywords for x period of time mm -hmm. so this could be um, a new product launch it could be just you want to change how people feel about your brand you might have a rebrand and you need to change the visual language about how people talk about your brand. Uh, and this is the way that you can seed that. You sort of put these images there and you, you're having them rank up. Um, most of our campaigns will, will run six plus months because of that. So in actually order to shift perception at scale, you want these images sitting there you know, for a long enough time so they can really get used. Are you able to give a range of, of kind of generally how much these brand deals are? Yeah, uh, 150K, almost up to a million. And how do you navigate attribution? Yeah, so we were able to show a lot of the public use cases because most of the use cases for these images get used in like blog posts or presentations. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got you know reverse image search technology where we can figure out you know a lot of these things where things are getting posted even if we don't have like tracking on the stuff. Yeah, uh, the API helps as well. So we sort of know views and downloads. We don't uh, we don't need a whole bunch of user data. What we're really looking at is just, you know, what were the places where people were using this uh, and then owned and operated. We've got, um, you know, a, a nice data set there as well to show views and downloads, engagements. Uh, and in, in, in all cases, we offer the option to do something with Kantar as well. So we run uh, brand lift studies with Kantar 
um, if you want to see further into those insights as well. So what's coming down the line, if anything, that we haven't talked about in terms of monetization strategy and how that ties into the product over the future? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's just really interesting compounding factors that are happening on the site. So the more um, API integrations that happen, the more the library is growing. So these are all things we're working on, like Unsplash uh, has kind of been known for this high quality, almost like aspirational outdoorsy kind of photos. And uh, that's one use case, but there's like tens of thousands of use cases. And what we noticed is we actually built up the library, but a lot of the images weren't properly put in different searches. Um, so once we started to recategorize those, we, had, we noticed tons of demand in all these other categories where people were looking for images, but the search results weren't that effective. So it's just this really powerful moment where it seems like the market has really, you know, if I need an image to use, I'm thinking Unsplash. Mm -hmm. People are skipping Google images. They're, they're coming to Unsplash. Uh, and so now our responsibility is really just, you, you have the bar is up, right? People think of you as a search engine. You have to be as good as Google or better. Yeah. Uh, and so really that's the focus for us is, is getting visual search to this level, you know, where it's super high quality. We can predict uh, like what you probably want next, which is a different kind of predict than um, intent-based search because people are more like emotional when they're coming mm -hmm. to them. So they're looking for a, an image that portrays something. You know, if you're, if you're talking, uh, writing a post about guitar lessons, for example, um, you might want a picture of a guitar, but you might want something that implies that as well. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to be able to draw those lines based on how, you know, searches go and try to recommend better images. So really yeah, it's, it's as, as simple as building, yeah, a sort of a better product and that better experience because we, we see the demand that's sitting on the site. What does monetization look like on the creator side since Unsplash ultimately is a marketplace and, and you have so many photographers contributing their images? Yeah, so we keep, um, first, all anyone who's submitting images, we don't charge them anything. They can submit images for free uh, and they go up on the site. And really most, the way people, most people use the site is they're sort of looking for a downstream, you know, how can I leverage this to book a gig or get booked for something else for this. You know, I actually do videography on the side, but these are sort of my visual stories with photos. And uh, because on Unsplash people can use them, more people end up seeing them. Mm -hmm. So more people end up coming to my stuff and being able to see me. Uh, and I sort of, sort of draw this comparison to like when blogging started. A lot of people like when blogging started, they're oh, it's going to kill writing. It's going to kill the book and all these things. But uh, the opposite happened. More ideas came out, more books were published, more books were bought. Uh, sort of information sort of grew. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's that that same thing that's happened. This is just visual blogs, visual stories. Uh, and so there's that downstream effect that's happening. And we're also seeing a lot of that with the brands that we work with. About half the brands have hired uh, Unsplash photographers. So we help make that happen as well. Um, so there is actual like real monetization that happens through the platform. Uh, well, Mikhail, excited to see Unsplash keep growing. Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for listening to the Monetizing Media Podcast. To keep learning more tactical insights on the media, entertainment, and gaming industry, subscribe to my Monetizing Media newsletter at monetizingmedia.com.